Father, thank you so much for this day and this opportunity to be at this beautiful church, Father. Father, bless the hearts and the ears that will hear this message today, Father, and bless the words that come out of my mouth, Father. Let they be a blessing and useful to those that hear it. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for this church. We thank you for the leadership of Josh Canales and his pastoral staff, Father. We thank you so much for the, the mission of Mission Ebenezer, Father. And we thank you again for all the goodness you provide in our daily walk. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So I have a challenge today to kind of weave in mental health and how that's important for us. And I, and I also have a challenge to, to talk about some concepts that I think are important uh, for all of us, and me in particular. When I share, when I teach, when I preach, I always look at how this would affect my life and my family's life, first of all. And I hope and pray that these words and these themes will be relevant for you. I'm also gonna show you a little bit about the brain today and talk about the brain. Talk about depression and anxiety, because I'll tell you about my background as well. But let me, let me tell you a little bit about my background so to give you some context. I did my undergraduate studies at the University of California, Irvine. I was a pre-medicine major. I wanted to go to medical school because medical doctors make a lot more money than pastors. <laughs> most pastors, most pastors. Uh, I was ready to go to medical school. I was applying and about to take something called the MCAT test. I didn't take it, but I was about to take it. And someone said, why don't you volunteer at a hospital? And I said, okay, I'll do that. And they put me on St. Joseph's Hospital. I speak Spanish, more or less. They stuck me on as a translator on the OBGYN ward. <laughs> oh, yeah, it gets worse, my friends. And I thought to myself, that's where the babies are born. I love babies. Put me on that ward. And they put me on the OBGYN ward. And they gave me a pager back in the day. And I went to all the appointments. And the pager went off for the first night of the first delivery. It, and it was amazing. I was so excited and thrilled. I remember shouting to my apartment roommates, I'm off to save the world and deliver my first baby. And it's because it was two o'clock in the morning. They said, shut up, it's two o'clock. I got to the hospital and everything changed. A light bulb went on. Everything exciting about medicine wasn't so exciting anymore. The rooms were covered in blue sheets and there was heart pressure monitors and blood pressure monitors and the nurses were serious and occasionally a doctor would show up. And That first labor was a 16 hour delivery. 16 hours of screaming, crying, fainting, and a little bit of vomiting. And all of it was coming for me. <laughs> she was fine. I was in Spanish going, ya no puedo. You know, I was like fainting and she said, levántate, ayúdame. And I was like, no, just breathe, just breathe. I realized a couple things in that moment. First of all, that medicine is a beautiful profession, but it wasn't for everybody and it wasn't for me. The other is that, have you ever heard the saying that childbirth is the most beautiful experience in the world? Liars. <laughs> Liars. If it's your baby, it is, right? But if it's somebody else's baby, it's like Alien 3. So I chose to go into psychology, clinical psychology, which is a branch of medicine, to study the brain, psychopharmacology, and diagnosis. And I went to Washington State University, got a master's and a PhD in clinical psychology, finished there. Then I went to UCLA Medical Center to do what we call our service or residency or traineeship at the, medal, at the hospital. And then I went to Cornell University to do a postdoc and to do more hours as, to, you know, as you get licensed. And there I left to go to Washington, D.C. I was invited to a position, a prestigious position, as director of the American Psychological Association Minority Fellowship Program, a program that funded my education. And I said, yeah, I'll go. And it was there that God spoke to me. And it wasn't a pleasant conversation. I was in DC two years. I had written about $20 million worth of grants for this organization. I was helping them. I was advancing my career. And, I was take, and one morning I took a train in. And I remember that day as if it was yesterday, it was snowing. It was beautiful. And we take a tra I took a train into work because that was the easiest way to, to commute back then. And I remember having a moment with God. And I was looking at my shiny shoes going, yeah, these are, I made it. I was looking at my briefcase, my brand new briefcase. Yeah, I was contemplating, saying, Lord, I got a corner office at the American Psych Association. And in Spanish, uh, there's a song by Vicente Fernandez that says, 
Y, eh, no hay que llegar primero, pero hay que saber llegar. You don't have to get there first, but you gotta know how to arrive. And I told the Lord, Lord, I've arrived in my Vicente Fernandez voice. And for the first time in my life, because I had been a believer for 10, 10 years of what God responded. And he said, well, what have you done for me? Like a hammer on my head, I realized I had done a lot for myself. I've gone through a lot of training, a lot of education. I've been to church and I've given my tithes. I've graduated from many programs, but I never graduated from the pews. I had just taken and taken, but I hadn't given. And I got frustrated with the Lord a little bit. I was like, Lord, why are you calling me now? I got $300,000 in student loan debt. I'm a psychologist. I'm a professional in Washington, D.C. Why are you calling me now? And I got into a season of prayer like we've all gotten into, which was, and the prayer is very simple. If you haven't done this prayer yet, be careful. Because you do this prayer, God will respond. Amen. And the prayer was simply this, Lord, use me. Use me, Lord. I don't know how you're going to use me. I don't know where gonna use, you're going to use me. But if you said you need me, use me. And he said, I need you in California. I was like, okay. I applied for three positions in California because that's where God said to go. One was as the Dean of Admissions at the College of Medicine at UC Irvine. Prestigious position. That was a well-paid position. They actually have housing for their administrators on their campus. They showed me the houses if I had applied and I got it. I might live in one of these nice little houses. The other was, was as chief psychologist in the Department of Psychiatry at Kaiser Permanente. Are you guys familiar with Kaiser? H paid really good benefits. And the third position was a lowly assistant professorship position at an Assemblies of God College, Vanguard University, then Southern California College. Now that position didn't pay very well. It didn't pay even enough. If, I had, if they had extended an offer and I accepted it, I wouldn't even have enough money to pay for an apartment because it's expensive in Orange County. This was 20 plus years ago. In fact, if I accepted an offer from them, I'd have to live with my in-laws for a year to save enough money. They lived in Costa Mesa. And I love my in-laws, just not that much. <laughs> interviewed, got all three offers, and I went to the Lord with my petition. Lord, send me to the medical school. Lord, I'll bring, I'll, I will bring you the medical, the doctors to be. I will inculcate into them the word of the Lord in my efforts, in my behavior, because I can't preach to them, Lord. Medical school, Lord, medical school. My wife was already picking out the house that we were going to live in on the campus. And God said, no, you're going to Vanguard University. And I just, I was blown away. And it was a very clear, almost audible, I'm not schizophrenic yet, voice that said, no, you're going to Southern California College, Vanguard University. And then I prayed about it and I think, and I, and I said, well, let me go back to the Lord, because I don't think he understood me. <laughs> and I said, Lord, well then send me to Kaiser, because they had great benefits and a good sound. Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll bring you the patients. I will preach to them, Lord, with my actions and acts of kindness and love, Lord, I'll reach them, Lord. And he said, nope, Vanguard University. And there we went. And we stayed there with my in-laws for a year. We got very close. <laughs> what I know today that I didn't know 22 years ago is that God sent me there as a professor not to teach, but to learn. Not to teach psychology or Christian psychology or faith in psychology, but to learn what it was and is, and I'm still learning to be humble and to be a servant. And we went there. The message today is pretty simple. And we'll talk about psychology and mental health, but it's that you have to be strong and courageous. And you have to be faithful and obedient to God. Even when things aren't clear, even when you're scared, even when times are tough. Strength and courage and faithfulness and obedient is the theme to, for today. And it comes from the book of Joshua. It's very easy to me to go to that book. It's my, one of my favorite passages in uh, chapter one, verses one through nine, where God calls upon Joshua after Moses has died. 
And he says, you're going to take these people to the promised land. And that chapter is often interpreted as a, as a chapter of leadership and often of pastoral leadership, but it doesn't stop there. That, that leadership transcends to being a mother, to being a father, to being a, a hard worker, to bring a brother or sister, to bring a leader in your church. It transcends that. And I think that those are words and a message that we can live today. We need to remember what the passage says. And there's a five or six or 10 points that are real critical. And that is, you have to be strong and courageous. It wasn't a, a suggestion or a recommendation by the angel of the Lord. It was a commandment. I comm and he didn't just command Joshua once, but three times. Be strong and courageous. He also tells him to stay on the path before him. And that everywhere his feet will touch, he will be successful. But he has to be strong and courageous. And he's got to keep going forward. He's got to meditate on the law of Moses day and night. And I think most importantly for me is, as you're going through difficult times, is a reminder that if you are strong and courageous, if you are faithful and obedient, if you meditate on the word of the law, and if you stay forward and not deviate to the right or to the left, you'll be successful. But the most important thing is that God will be with you always. Amen? I'm gonna talk a little bit about fears and phobias. Who here has a fear of something? All right, Josh, I was pretty quick, Pastor Josh. Well, we'll talk later, bro. That was what are you afraid of, Pastor Josh? All right. Sounds like there's probably a couple other things behind that, but who else has a fear of phobia? What are you afraid of, sister? Sister, what are you afraid of? Heights. I would disagree. That's it. It's falling. It's not rats generally, but what they can do to you, or they're just disgusting. Who else has a fear? What is it? Failure. Okay. That's good. The unknown, kind of existential, just not knowing, or you're making sure that you're doing everything you possibly could uh, do that's good. I often tell people, I'm not afraid of, you know, you know LABI, we're a poor little Bible college. Uh, you know, I ended up, let me tell you real quickly how I ended up there. I, um, I was at a medical school as a vice president. I had just been promoted the third time in two years. Huge salary, I was super happy. But I'd asked the Lord, Lord, I wanna go back to Christian higher education. And I prayed about it. And I said, Lord, I'm not going to apply. You're going to tell me where to go. And then, you know, if, it, if there's an opening that I'll pursue it. And I got contacted from Biola University. And nothing happened. I got contacted from APU and interviewed. Nothing happened. Vanguard said you were headhunted for the provost position at Vanguard. Nothing happened. And then our superintendent was emailing me and texting me. I knew they needed a president at LABI College. And I was like, and I was like talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, you don't want to send me to LABI College, do you? That little Bible college. I'm not a theologian, although I'm an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God. So just, I got that cut. But LABI College, man, that place is closed once before. They're poor. They're not accredited. It's a Bible college. I'm not a theologian. I'm barely a pastor. I pastored a homeless church for 10 years, but my, you know, that was my experience with the homeless, you know. And I was like, no, that's not it. So I, I ignored our superintendent's messages. And then the chairman sent me a Facebook message. You guys ever want to connect with me on Facebook? He sent me a Facebook message. He said, and so everybody could see it. You know, Dr. Marty, we need to talk. I was like, oh, man. So I called him up and he's, and as if God was speaking through him, he said, we need you at LABI College. We need your experience. We need your grant writing experience. We need your accreditation experience. We need your leadership experience. We need you at LABI College. And I was like, okay. And then I interviewed a couple of, you know, within a couple of weeks and I, they, they made me the offer. And I sat with them at a, at a restaurant and we were going over the offer. And I said, well, uh, uh, Dr. John, tell me about um, uh, the benefits. And you go, oh, there ain't no benefits. And typically they extend a contract to a president that's typically about five years. Nice, well, promising, committing to you. And I said, well, well, tell me about the contract, Dr. John. He goes, oh, there's no contract. Oh, we can let you go tomorrow. And school could close for all we know. 
I was like, ah. Oh. And finally, of course, I had to ask about the money. And I said, I said, Dr. John, not for me, but for my wife who likes to, <laughs> who, who will undoubtedly ask me the question when I get home, how much does it pay? And he didn't even tell me, he just laughed and said, oh, it's about a third of what you're making now. But when he said those words, I was reminded about the book of Joshua. I was reminded about being faithful and obedient. I was reminded about how I went to Vanguard in the first place 22 years ago. And I realized if we're faithful and obedient to God, he will take care of us and he will take care of our needs. So when he finished those words, as much as they hurt, at the same time, I knew I was accepting because this was from God. I left the medical school and everybody at the medical school, I don't think there was a single person that said stay. I, I don't, I mean, go. They all said stay. Not a single person said Go on, go on to LABI. They, they, basically, the messages were from the president on down. Don't go. You've got a good job. You just got promoted. You just launched a physician assistant program. You, you got a, a pre-med program approved. Stay here. Your career is going to go up and up and up. And that school has even closed before. We did some research. And I wrote them all a letter and hand delivered it to most of them. And the basic gist of the message was, I've never feared losing a job. I've never feared not having a paycheck. I've never feared not being able to provide. But what I've always feared is not being under the will of God and not following his purpose and plan for my life. I'm leaving. God bless you all. And I did. I've been there now five years. I don't know how much longer. I've been here five years. And we've achieved the highest level of accreditation, as I shared earlier. We're the only Bible college that's state approved in the state of California. We're also eligible for financial aid and we're pursuing that. And God is good. We're on the verge. We're still struggling, but we're, we're, we've met all the expectations that the state has for us as well. I want to talk a little bit about the brain. When does your brain fully develop? What do you, what do you think it is? 26, who said that? 18, who said that? 21. Who, wait, what did I hear over here? You, okay, what's your name? Okay, Ronald's right, 25. Let's look at the pictures of the brain. So real quickly, back part of your brain, there's an area called the occipital lobe, area 17, visual cortex. You actually see in the back part of your brain, not up here, you see back here. When you get hit in the back of the head, that's what, because you see stars. But this is where your brain sees. The parietal lobe is more for sensation and movement. Uh, the the uh, uh, temporal lobe, right by your temple, is for auditory, for listening. And the last part of your brain to develop, at about 25, is the frontal lobe. And this is the part that makes logical, pragmatic, executive decisions. It doesn't develop to your 25. Now, who here is, is uh, over 25? Raise your hand. Y'all are old. Think back when you were 15. And think back when you made decisions when you were 15. Were they good decisions? It's because you were brain damaged. <laughs> Your frontal cortex was not fully developed. This is important for a lot of reasons. And if our brain is healthy, I think our spiritual walk can be healthy as well. And this is important. Let's look at the next slide. We're probably gonna go through a couple of these slides pretty quickly. Next slide. Next one. Stop right there. Doing drugs and alcohol before you're 25 can impact your brain. Your brain has the consistency of soft butter. That's how delicate it is. When you play sports, and I played sports, Pastor Josh played sports, so we both have brain damage. Uh, but if you protect your brain, you can be okay. And there's ways to do it to protect your brain. But drugs and alcohol, when do people start using drugs and alcohol? After 25? Oftentimes not. If I could tell you one thing you can do in your church or in your family is to tell your kids, Google this on, uh, online to see their brain when it's drinking alcohol or when it's doing drugs. It damages your brain. It's toxic to your brain. It's poison to your brain. It affects who you are. And if you get addicted to some of this stuff, then it changes your personality. And you're not who you are, let alone not be able to worship and praise the Lord and walk in a spiritual way if your brain is damaged. You look at Dr. Harris here. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Did I ever do drugs or alcohol? Why are you laughing, bro? You don't know me. <laughs> never did drugs. Never smoked a cigarette. 
but here's the reason why. Because I grew up poor. And drugs and cigarettes cost money. I remember at 12, somebody offered me a cigarette. And they were like cool and hip. This was the 70s. And they offered it to me. I was like, well, wait a minute. How much is that? And back then, it was like 75 cents a pack in the 70s. And I remember that was exactly the cost of a Big Mac. I was like, no, thank you. That's a Big Mac. I'm hungry. Two years later, somebody offered me a little cigarette after a football game. And it smelled funny. And I knew it was marijuana. And they said, hey, Marty, try this, little, try this one. I said, well, wait a moment. How much is that? And back then, it was like $10 a gram. And I was like, they said, $10 a gram. I said, well, that, that's 10 Big Macs. <laughs> then I hear if you smoke that, it makes you hungry. Man, I will die to, from starvation. I start smoking that. <laughs> Never did drugs. But if you protect your brain. Right, let me show you that image again, uh, Pastor, that, the image of the brain. This, this is called SPECT imaging. You don't have to take any notes. SPECT imaging is called single photon emission computerized tomography. And one of the experts on this is Daniel Amen, Dr. Daniel Amen, who's a friend of mine. And we've done actually research together. He's a neuro, neuropsychiatrist. He's actually a graduate of Vanguard University, and he's a believer. But if you look at the holes in the brain there, what happens is it's not real holes, it's holes in the functioning of your brain. They inject your blood with a radioactive substance that tags to oxygen use, regional cerebral blood flow, and also uh, glucose metabolism. Your brain uses sugar. Where it doesn't, it leaves a hole. And where there's a hole, it's your brain's dying or dead. So don't do drugs. Next image. We can see, next one, that's a pet image and an MRI on the left. Next one. Here is an opioid dependent. And in fact, that brain, a normal brain's to the left, healthy brain, somebody who's opioid dependent. It also looks like a crystal meth brain. That also looks like a schizophrenic brain. So somebody who's addicted to opioids or addicted to crystal meth, or, addict, or schizophrenic, has a brain that looks like that. With the schizophrenic brain, it's not going to heal. But if you stop using drugs for at least a year, your brain will recuperate. It may not get to the perfect position it was before, but it'll get better. OK, next, next slide. Alzheimer's disease on the left, and depression on the right. Next slide. A stroke. So if you look at the right, there's a stroke in the healthy brain. Next one. And here's a poster of people who use drugs. So you could Google this online and get this poster. And if you want to talk about this afterwards, come and talk to me as well. Okay? But your brain is an important part of your spiritual walk. What is a disorder? You guys mentioned fears or phobias. Do I have any fears or phobias? The answer is yes. I'm afraid of sharks and flying. Well, don't judge me. Jaws is still out there. Why? Well, because I learned to be afraid of sharks because of Jaws. And then Jaws 2 came out. And Jaws 3 in 3D. And I was just a kid. And I know he's waiting for that Mexican buffet out there. <laughs> I know the fear. I don't like to fly. And I, don't, and I wish I could talk to the pilots right before the flight. Because I don't understand them when they're talking to me during the flight. And then they tell you at 35,000 feet that we've reached 35,000 feet, our cruising altitude. Now you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the flight. I'm like, well, I would have if you didn't tell me we're at 35,000 feet. And I want to know, did they, where did they graduate from the pilot? The Harvard School of Flying or the Tijuana Tech School of Flying? <laughs> I want to know if he's happy or if he needs a group hug, you know, or a prayer. We should start every airplane flight with a group prayer. Just grabbing each other. I don't care what your faith is. Let's just hold hands and pray to God that we get through this. But a fear isn't of itself a disorder. And I wanted to find that for this group here. And I know that this isn't a mental health class, but it's important. I want you to also know that I'm qualified to teach and train this. Our, our general superintendent, Reverend Doug Clay, if you know him, he's the superintendent of all the assemblies of God, personally invited me to be part of a working group on mental health for pastors, because I think that's so important. I also, whether you know this or not, and most of you don't, I do counseling, pastoral counseling for pastors, only for pastors. Because pastors experience a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of attacks, and they don't have the support. They have depression, anxiety, sometimes addictions, and, and sometimes marital problems. So I pastor the pastors. And in fact, 
I do it for free. And I believe if we bless and equip our pastors, we bless and equip the whole church because they're supported. There's things that we can do, church, to make ourselves healthier and better in our spiritual walk. Number one is, you got to remember this. You can't control the thoughts and feelings of others or the behavior of others. You can't. Even your children. Maybe when they're really little, you can withhold food from them. But you can't control them. You can't. Now, you got to remember, so you can't control somebody else's thinking, their feelings, or what they're going to do. You can't control them. Some of you, I know, are trying. You have to remember this as well. Nobody should be able to control your thoughts or your feelings or your behavior. They should not be able to control that. In Spanish, there's a word, manipuladora, manipulator. Oh, they just manipulate. Oh, she's just a manipulator. He's just a manipulator. And they come and tell me this in my office all the time. And I look at them and I said, nope, you let yourself be manipulated. You've got to control your thoughts and your feelings and your actions. You can influence with love, but you've got to control that. So remember that, church. What are the professionals that can help us when we're stressed out? And I want to share that just as kind of informational. We can go to a marriage family therapist, a social worker sometimes, a psychologist, counseling or clinical, a psychiatrist, even your medical doctor. And if you don't want to go to anybody, go to your medical doctor. And psychiatrists and psychologists will say, no, don't go to them, come to us. Go to your medical doctor. Because they have a general understanding of depression and anxiety. And that's what most people suffer from. So they can help you a little bit with that or prescribe something if you need it for that. So go to them as well. What are the symptoms of depressions? Church, tell me some symptoms. I got six minutes left. What are five minutes left? What are some symptoms of depression? Sleep problems, sadness, hopelessness, helplessness, uh, obviously depression, thoughts of suicide. Now I'm gonna pause there for one 30 seconds and that is suicide isn't a normal response to depression. Just because somebody's depressed, most people that are depressed don't wanna kill themselves. Depression, as Dr. Marty defines it, and it'll make sense, is not a response to depression. Suicide is not a response to depression. Suicide is a response to overwhelming, unbearable pain in their life. Suicide is a response to pain that they can't handle anymore in terms of their physical aspects of their body. They're suffering so much. The emotional aspects of some pain. They lost somebody. They just can't bear to go on or even the spiritual aspects. That's what suicide is a response to. We need to remember that. And, and I can come back and do a lecture on how do you assess for suicide. I do that with pastors all the time. We don't have time today for that. As believers, we have within our tool back powerful tools to get us through mental and psychological conditions. More so than the rest of the world. I'm telling you, more so, and it's practical, pragmatic. I've studied it, I've researched it. I did research at Teen Challenge, Saddleback Church, Union Rescue Mission, LA Mission, study this and this is the results that I've gotten. But here's some challenges within the church as well. Of, of the pastors that I've worked with, pastors now, over half of them struggle with this thing and I'm assuming we struggle with it too. Pride and unforgiveness. Pride and unforgiveness. Something's going on in the church. They're being attacked and there's some pride issue going on. Or they're just, just, even pastors, they can't forgive. And when you unforgive, if we're not able to forgive, and this is, it's easy for me to say, forgive, forgive, it'll help you. You'll sleep better. And of course, it'll change your brain chemistry. and It'll do all of that. But forgiveness frees you from stealing. If you don't forgive, if you don't forgive church, you're stealing. What? Yeah, you're stealing. You're stealing from your husband or wife because the bitterness that you have in your heart that could have been love to offer to your husband or wife is now anchored to that bitterness. You're stealing. You're stealing from your children because you can't fully give to them all the love that God has through you and extend it to your children. You're stealing from yourself because you don't sleep at night. You toss and turn, you're bitter, you're upset, you're you lose sleep. You're stealing from yourself. These people are taking rent up in your head. 
and, you ha- and they're not even paying rent. Raise the rent, kick them out. And then you're stealing from God because you can't completely, authentically, and with genuineness worship God if you've got that bitterness in your heart. You've got to forgive. We have in our tool back, I'm just going to rattle them off because I've only got three minutes left. We have hope. A powerful hope. I've dealt with people who've had so much loss you can't believe it. Lost all their family, their home, their job, their pets. But they're not depressed. They might be sad and they're not clinically depressed. They have hope. Even in the depths of their depression or the anxiety or the stress or whatever the the world has challenged them with, they have meaning. Because God promises us that. And even in the moment, and I've been through those times where I'm like, Lord, I don't see the meaning in this. But we can resolve to that, Lord, you're going to explain it to me when the time is right. And your timing is perfect and mine isn't. I don't understand, but you'll help me understand. We have hope. We have forgiveness. We have humility. We have meaning. We have purpose in our lives. The non-believer doesn't. There's a new one I picked up just a couple of weeks ago. I'm taking a course from the National Board of Medical Examiners to be a health and wellness expert. And uh, this is a good one. And that is gratitude. If we have gratitude, and if we have these things, hope, meaning, purpose, understanding, and gratitude in everything that we're doing, our brains are different. Our brains are physically different. We have, it, 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 it's more impactful than Prozac. That's how powerful these things are when working together. Amen? Lastly, I want to talk about exercise. You may look at me and say, I don't exercise. Why well, do you have to laugh? You say, yeah, I say, yeah, I say, Pastor. No, no, I exercise regularly, believe it or not. But, and I'd love to lose weight. And it's going to happen. It's going to take some time. But Big Macs are calling every day. <laughs> right outside my gym, there's a McDonald's. Literally, you could see it when I'm on the treadmill. I'm going, oh, I'm going to give me some fries later. <laughs> how, many, how many more calories I got to burn to get those fries? But if you exercise on the treadmill, it's been shown to have equal to or greater effect than antidepressant medication for depression and mild to moderate depression and anxiety. If you just exercise regularly, walk three or four miles on the treadmill if you can, get your heart rate up, your brain chemistry is pumping out chemicals that are more powerful than antidepressant medication. And in fact, when I work with pastors, oftentimes they're coming, you need some medication. I tell them, look, here, let me write this down, go take it to the doctor and tell them to prescribe. No, no, I don't want to take any medication. Well, then you're going to have to exercise then. And oh, I'll do it, I'll do it. And they come back in a month. What was the name of that medication? Can I try it? I'll, I'll do it. But at least try to do it. And I do it. And I don't do it just because I'm trying to lose weight. I do it because it impacts um, how I am. Uh, I, I just want to end with have strength and courage in what you're doing. God is with you. Fear, courage is not the absence of fear. Listen to me, church. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the ability to move forward one step after the other in the direction that God has purposed for your life despite the fear that may be around you. Amen? I'm going to do a a, a, a prayer just sit, staying where you're at. Just raise your hand if you'd like a special prayer about strength or courage or emotional health or mental health. If you know somebody who's struggling with an emotional mental health, let me just pray over that and I'll end. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Bow our heads, let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for the power of prayer, Father, in our lives, for the ability to reach out directly to you, Father. For those that have their hands raised or that raise their hands, Father, I ask for a special blessing on their lives, that you give them purpose, Father, that you remind them of the promises that you have for them, Father, that they reflect the promises in their walk with their heads held high, understanding that your promises for their lives will be fulfilled, Father. For those struggling with anxiety, stress, or depression, Father, or addictions, or marital problems, Father, bless their lives. Heal them, Father, and and bring them towards the path of, of wellness and health, Father, so that they can please you, Father, with a more pure worship, Father, with a more 
pure walk with you, Father, and just bless them, Father, in everything that they're doing. Father, we thank you and praise you for everything that you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Amen.